What is fortunate is that God designed humans, not the scientists. So what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that when scientists look at something, they'll see it through their own eyes and they, see, they miss what's the obvious. So if we're going to talk about metabolism during exercise, this is where the body stores its fuels, either as carbohydrate in the liver or in muscle or as triglycerides in the fat. And I spent 33 years or so studying carbohydrate metabolism from glycogen to, 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 carbo to, to, to lactate. In, for example, in muscle, I spent a whole lot of time studying how quickly you can absorb carbohydrate in the gut. All the time, we were looking at carbohydrates and we were looking, forgetting about fat. And so on this diagram, you can see what's the focus. The focus is carbohydrate. Why? Because I was funded by the carbohydrate industry to prove carbohydrates make you run faster. So my bias was there. But when you actually look at the real picture, look where the energy is. That's where the energy is. So God must have designed it for a reason to put all that energy into fat and so little energy into carbohydrate. There must be a reason. So there, there it is. This is the comparison. This is how much energy you have in fat and that's how much energy you have in carbohydrate. So when you just look at that, how do you think God designed us? To burn carbohydrate or to burn fat? Now what happened historically was that so it's been estimated that adipose tissue at stores alone can supply sufficient energy for nearly four days of running compared to less than two hours using muscle glycogen stores. So there has to be a reason why that was so. Now I spent, as I've said, years and years and years studying where the energy came from during exercise. So we had people exercise for three hours and we measured exactly how much fat they burned, how much glucose and how much muscle glycogen. And we studied them when they were non-loaded and we studied them when they were carbohydrate loaded. And what you notice is when you're carbohydrate loaded, you burn much less fat. So you burn much more carbohydrate. So in hindsight, it seems that we wanted to prevent all fat oxidation. That was our goal, and we didn't realize it. Why would you want to stop all fat oxidation? But that's what happens if you prescribe carbohydrates. And we couldn't see that at the time, and many still don't understand that, that the more carbohydrate you eat, the less fat you're going to burn. So you're inhibiting the one fuel that is a huge amount in the body. So then we even went further and we studied exogenous carbohydrate. That's carbohydrate that you take in by mouth. And then you can see that it replaces some of the endogenous carbohydrate. And again, the fat is not being burned. You're mainly burning carbohydrate. So the focus was and is on maximum carbohydrate use and sparing glycogen by increasing exogenous glucose delivery. But the best way to spare muscle glycogen is to burn more fat. But we couldn't see it. We were so ingrained to thinking that carbohydrate is everything that we just ignored the role of fat. Here, for example, we'll show you, this was an athlete I helped become one of the greatest athletes in South Africa. And this is 1981 when we were researching and helping him and he said it's not possible for me to run my best in a long distance race without ingesting a high carbohydrate drink, especially for the last hours of the race. And we developed the first goo in the whole world was developed by myself and by him. And here it is. The Leffen Fordyce Rose No Squeezy is the original carbohydrate syrup product available to endurance athletes. That's how history will remember the two of us as <laughs> <laughs> producing this carbohydrate. We did the only placebo controlled carbohydrate loading study that has ever been done. And why don't people use placebo controlled trials? Because they might get the answer they don't want. And this study was not funded by industry, so we could do some other things. And we gave the guys a placebo carbohydrate, and this is the performance over 100 kilometers. There was the time, and you will notice that there is no difference. This is the only carbohydrate loaded trial that's ever been done with a placebo, and it showed no effect. <laughs> but let me show you my bias. This is how scientists are. Oh, this is now 2000 and this is what we write. This placebo controlled trial shows that carbohydrate loading, and then I put it in capitals, did not improve performance during which carbohydrate was consumed. So you know what we said? It had to be the carbohydrate consumption that, that this, this destroyed the difference. By preventing any fall in blood glucose concentrations, carbohydrate ingestion may offset any detrimental effects of performance on lower pre-exercise muscle glycogen and liver glycogen concentrations. So we essentially disproved that, but we couldn't believe it, you see. So we had to explain why, oh yes, you must still take your carbohydrates because they're still going to work. But we, didn't, we couldn't conclude that because that wasn't what we did. But to get the paper published, we probably had to add that. 
Okay, <laughs> so. But now if you go back to the 1940s and 50s, this was one of the greatest runners of all time, Jim Peters. He rode, reduced the world record in the marathon by seven minutes. Seven minutes in, in three years. And it was really interesting because he came about at the end of the Second World War. He was a great runner. And this is what he said. We were still rationed for meat and none extra could be attained. At the time of the 1948 Olympics, we were given extra meat and received food passes from overseas. But in 1952 Olympics, that had stopped. The only thing that could be done was to try to make up with extra bread and potatoes. And look what he says, which is probably not the best food on which to run over 100 miles a week in training. This is the opinion of the 1948-1952 runner. And this man, you read, he trained hard. He really trained fast all his life. So we, we forget that. We've got to go back to the 50s and see what people were eating. And I've spoken to them. Ron Clark, who died recently, I asked him. He held 17 world records in Australia. And I said, do you ever carbohydrate load? You know, we just, we just ate normal food. That Fred will talk about that. But then along comes Stephen Finney, and he does this study. And he concludes from this study, he adapts group to a high-fat diet, and he said four weeks of adaptation to the ketogenic diet resulted in no change in endurance performance. That's not quite true, because here are the data. And what the data show that in some people, exercise performance, this is the ketogenic diet in the darker color, went up dramatically, for 84%, 30%, and in some it dropped dramatically. So what he should have said, that was a biphasic response. Some responded incredibly and some very poorly to the diet. That's what the conclusion should have been, but we were all blind, of course. He was blind at the time as well. He influenced me, and we did our own high-fat diet study, in 19, published in 1994, so we would have started thinking about this in the 90, late 1980s, and we found an effect. We found a big effect on performance. So here we were, a group that adapted to a high-fat diet or a high-carbohydrate diet, and they did two hours of exercise, and then they had to exercise at a fixed work rate for as long as they possibly could. So they started depleted, muscle glycogen depleted, and then they exercised for as far long as they could. And guess what happened? The group on the high-fat diet had a much better performance. So, but, but this is now 1994. Do you think it changed my mind? Not one iota. Completely ignored it. That can't be true. You see? So, <laughs> Now the question is, let's say we extend this exercise here. What happens to the high carbohydrate group? They're metabolically crippled. They're metabolically crippled because they can't burn fat. I showed you that slide. They can't burn fat. Let's go back. They can't burn fat. The fat's stuck there. They can't burn more fat. They've got no glycogen. What are they going to do? So technically they're in trouble. So this is quite interesting uh, an interesting study, and what you really need to do now is to see what happens thereafter. And unfortunately, we, we haven't done that as yet. So, so the prediction then is, so fat adapted can oxidize fat at 1.2 grams per minute during exercise. As a result, most humans can perform most forms of exercise just burning fat. That, that has to be the conclusion. And so, is that why we store so much energy as fat? And that's my conclusion, that that humans are designed to burn fat and that we have converted ourselves to carbohydrate burning metabolic cripples by eating so much carbohydrate. So I want to talk about the average person and the per that's what you have to understand. So the previous lecture talked about the metabolic syndrome and, and made the point, as I believe, that all those diseases are the same. They all result of insulin resistance. So the disease of insulin resistance is not this. Those are, those are the symptoms. The disease is this disease. And the point is we all lie somewhere on this curve. And what I have, I sit at this end with type 2 diabetes, highly carbohydrate resistant. And if you are carbohydrate tolerant, you can do what you like. And I suspect that the world's best athletes probably are highly insulin sensitive and can burn more carbohydrate and probably need to burn more carbohydrate to run really fast over 800 meters, 1500 meters. I don't contest that that I guess those guys are highly insulin sensitive. But once the event goes longer than two or three hours, I think the story changes. And if you sit on this end and you eat all the carbohydrates that I told you to eat, uh, then that's what's going to happen. You're going to get type 2 diabetes like me. So that's terribly important. And that's what we forget. We don't individualize the diet for the individual athlete. And so it is absolutely criminal to tell an athlete with insulin resistance to eat a high carbohydrate diet because they will get type 2 diabetes. 
winning the Comrades Marathon because well, I told him to eat lots of carbohydrates and we thought he would be fantastic. Well, a few years later, he's not looking so great. He's got the metabolic syndrome, okay? And he's, he's on the high-carb diet, you can see he's got a bit of a belly and he's got terrible legs and he's got fat on the back <laughs> and so on. So, <laughs> so we convert him to the high-fat diet and this is him looking, and this is with Zola Bud, one of the great South African athletes. This is, he just finished the Comrades Marathon, which here he finishes in 5 hours 30, here he finishes in 10 hours, and here he finishes in 7.5 hours at the age of 55. He now runs 5 kilometers in 18 minutes at altitude, at the age of 60, at 55. He's looking amazing, okay? So there's a classic insulin resistance story for you. And so I caused his metabolic syndrome, but I also saved him in the end. So the last team we converted was the, English, it was the Australian cricket team. And there were four players on this team who, we've, who have admitted to converting. And I don't know how many others have converted. But I want to introduce you to two of them. And this is Shane Watson, who struggled all his life with obesity. Well, not with obesity, obviously. He said, I always had to starve at the start of the season. And I was convinced I was always going to be fat. I said... Shane, tell me about your father. He's got type 2 diabetes. And he said, absolutely. Australian cricket, unable to control his weight using conventional methods. Family history of type 2 diabetes. Weight control, effortless on a high-fat diet. He says, amazing. Getting up and eating steak and eggs for breakfast is just amazing. Now, the other chubby guy on the team was a guy called David Warner. And David Warner was the chubby little uh, guy on the, on the team. And now look at this. Okay, there's no metabolic syndrome. This is, he just scored 100 runs, which is... And up to May last year, he was the world's best cricketer. And he said the change was also astonishing. I've increased my energy. It's helped my recovery. I'm not out of breath when I run between wickets when batting in cricket, which is interesting. That's an interesting observation. So, and then if you're watching the Rugby World Cup, Australia are one of the competitive teams. I think New Zealand probably win, but Australia are going to come close. And they're going to come close because of this guy. And David Pocock, there's a whole story, and I'll take 10 minutes, so I can't tell you about it, but actually he's a Zimbabwean like myself. And he wrote to me a few months ago, and, I'm, and uh, he, he wrote to me, sorry, so the point is, if you're watching the Rugby World Cup, watch for seven, number seven or number eight Australia. If, if Australia win, it's because of this guy. He's special. And this is what he said. For the past three years, I've been following a diet based on Western Price and, Western Price and Sally Fallon's work. And after seeing your work on banting, I finally decided to give it a go about six month, months ago. I'm feeling fitter and stronger than I ever have. And he's playing brilliant rugby. And this is a guy playing at the highest level and he's now on the banting diet. And he was also insulin resistant. So now I've given you some of the background. Now let's look at what the science is. And I've just got two more slides. And we looked at the studies of low carbohydrate diets. And it turns out there are only 11 studies. You ask, why is there only 11 studies? because there's no industry that's going to fund these. There are probably 11 studies a month on carbohydrates. So there's, there's publication bias. It's very important to understand that. There's so much data on carbohydrates and so little on fat. And of these studies, very few are long-term studies. They're like a weak study adaptation. Three showed significant positive effects. Four, a non-significant effect favoring the low carbohydrate group. Two, no effect. And a further two showing a clearly negative outcome. So, but there has to be real concerns about placebo effects because you can't hide the placebo effect when you're doing a high-fat diet. So it's almost impossible actually to do this research, except if you're studying metabolism. But if you're studying performance, very, very difficult. But if you looked at those studies, you'd say there's no evidence to say that a high-fat diet definitely impairs your performance, and there's no evidence to say it definitely imp uh, improves your performance. But this is the key, and this is what we forget. We forget that sport is not just a laboratory time trial over 100 kilometers in the laboratory. There are no studies of the effect of low-carbohydrate diets of ease of weight control, and I've shown you how easy those guys found in controlling their weight, capacity to train and ability, ability to recover from training. These athletes, when they adapt, like David Pocock, will tell you that I recover more quickly. From a bruising game like rugby, I recover more quickly. Their immune function and injury risk and their hand-eye hand coordination in capa or capacity to concentrate in sports like golf and cricket. And that's what the cricketers tell us. That's much easier to concentrate now because I'm not getting these glucose insulin spikes all the time. So the point is that that's what research needs to do. We can't just study people in a laboratory over a 100-kilometer time trial. 